Hey, welcome to our another edition of LTC Coffee Break. And yes, I am leading off, and that's unusual because I'm the biggest leadoff hitter in the league. Anyway, uh, as Michael promised last week, we're going to be speaking again with Dave Gresham uh, this week as it relates to the Section 162 bonus and how it works with asset care. Uh, just a quick reminder, Dave is with our advanced sales group, uh, and he's a JD, CLU, CHSC, CHCSNC, and uh, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, hopefully, you'll benefit from our conversation today. Um, Hey, Dave, can you tell us the overall setup and goal of a 162 bonus plan? Yes. You know, employers often find they need to provide additional benefits to retain the service of highly valued key employees. For example, client comes in and says, I have six shops across the state. Each shop has a dozen employees with one manager. The managers are key to my operation, and I want to do something special just for them. However, because of the non-discrimination rules associated with qualified retirement plans, such as 401ks and profit sharing plans, it can be difficult for employers to provide extra benefits for individuals who go above and beyond in their service to the employer. Even non-qualified deferred compensation plans are now subject to burdensome regulations as a result of Internal Revenue Code Section 409 Cap A. This was enacted uh, subsequent to the Enron collapse back in 2004. And that was a case where the bigwigs in the company walked with their non-qualified executive benefits and the rank and file basically uh, got the short end of the stick. And Congress said, after that, we're going to tighten up these non-qualified deferred comp rules. And the truth is now that non-qualified deferred comp is almost as expensive and burdensome to set up and comply with as qualified uh, plans. And so we f see, especially with small employers, there's not a lot of interest in non-qualified deferred comp. Ford Motor Company is still doing non-qualified deferred comp, but the non, uh, but the smaller employer rather is, is not likely to be interested. But they still have this problem where they have key people that you want to do something for. Well, you want to provide a discriminatory benefit uh, and so what do you use in that situation? One of the most common methods is an Internal Revenue Code Section 162 Executive Bonus Plan, which is an agreement that typically allows employers to use tax deductible money as a bonus to fund a life insurance policy for high value employees. And with asset-based long-term care products, the policy also includes a benefit for qualifying long-term care expenses. <clears throat> the core life premium on the hybrid product is declared as additional compensation on the employee's W-2 and is tax deductible to the employer as compensation paid. The annual taxes on the premium are in some cases funded by an additional cash bonus to the employee, which is referred to as a double bonus. Key employer in these cases is the owner of the life insurance policy, and once again, it provides long-term care benefits as well. Yeah. Uh, Dave, that's great. Appreciate that. Um, I think a really key question in terms of utilization would be, can the employer set this up selectively? Can they decide who they want to include and exclude and do that on a legal basis? Yes, Michael, it can. Indeed, it actually must be selective. There's an exemption from ERISA, qualified plan non, the, the ERISA non-qualified plan and qualified plan discrimination rules for plans that benefit a select group of management or highly compensated employees. Basically what this means is you cannot cover everyone. This is not a plan okay. for the file but for key employees of the employer. Okay, so just, just so I'm clear on that, they can set up the guidelines, they can set it up by either tenure within the company or um, or title, or they can set it up by uh, compensation or any of the above factors. So that's there's really some flexibility there. Is that correct? Yes, and those classifications actually come from the long-term care regulation side of it, where generally okay. you can discriminate long-term care benefits by class, but you can be very, lib very liberal in defining your class. In other words, regulations have said okay that uh, job title is, uh, is an adequate classification. Uh, years mm -hmm. of service is an adequate compensation or uh, uh, 
consideration or compensation is an adequate consideration for defining the class in, in your long care bill. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Dick. So inside of this, what are the advantages to the employer and the employee? Well, with asset-based long-term care products, there's potentially an even greater benefit than with straight life insurance bonus plans. The key is that with your hybrid long-term care products, there are two types of tax treatment for the plan. The core life insurance side is compensation. I always tell agents in the normal life insurance setting that life insurance is never deductible. It's not deductible as an individual on your individual return. It's not deductible by a business if the business has any interest in the policy. However, when an employer pays the premium on a policy that an employee owns, it's now deductible, not because it's life insurance, but because it's compensation. And so the employer deducts it as compensation, and the employer reports it as compensation. So between the two, it's actually a wash, but that's what happens with the tax treatment of the policy. So if the employer is funding for a non-owning key employee, the employer gets a current deduction, and that can have real meaning for your employer. The added benefit or consideration now with, once again, these hybrid policies is that your long-term care charges on the policy are indeed that, long-term care. And long-term care is treated differently than life mm -hmm. insurance. Long-term care is part of what's considered employer-provided medical coverage. And what is unique about asset care is that we define these charges out so you know exactly what they are. We define the, ex we, we, we define the acceleration of benefit charge on the core life policy as a writer charge, and we identify the charge for any continuation of benefits coverage you have. And we allow you to pay those one premium if you want. You can choose the mode you want. And so you have some, not only control of how you want the premium paid, but you can identify the long-term care portion of the policy. A lot of high pro hybrid providers do not do it that way, or they simply have it as a charge on a universal life policy uh, that, you know, if that monthly by the end of the year, you may have some identified charge, but you can't pay it all at once. And so, once again, Asset care is unique in the industry. We see a lot of business activity simply because of the way we have configured our policies. So let's get back to the treatment now of that acceleration of benefits charge and continuation of benefits charge, your long-term care charges on these policies. They're deductible by the employer, so employer provided medical coverage. And for your non-owning employee, they're not reported in income because it's employer provided medical coverage. Now, for your non-owning employees, this long-term care deduction is unlimited. And I say that with a caveat, it's as long as your overall employee compensation is reasonable. That's one of the requirements of Code Section 162 that says the employer can deduct compensation as long as it's reasonable. Once again, I mentioned it's very good for us at One America with the Care Solutions product line because we separate out the acceleration of benefits charge and continuation of, benef of benefits charges. So for example, you take a couple that's 60 years old and you buy joint coverage as an employer provided benefit. Now I say a couple because one of the provisions of deductions for long-term care is that you can provide coverage as an employer to the employee and the employee spouse and dependents. So we see a lot of joint coverage in these cases, right. probably see actually more joint coverage than single life coverage in the bonus okay. plans using these hybrid products. If you take a couple and you buy lifetime continuation coverage on that couple anywhere from age 50 to 70, normally you'll see that that long-term care premium is as much if not more than the core premium. And so it's a great way for the employer to say to the employee, here's an additional, an additional benefit, only half of which you have to include an income. And so that's a really attractive benefit for the employer and for the employee. Now I have to go one step further in this analysis about the benefits because if you're dealing with owners, there is another question as a rep you must ask. And that is how does the business do business? How is it organized? Is it a C corporation? Is it a partnership? Is it an LLP? Is it an S corp? Because for owner employees, that makes a difference. I'll start out with C-corporation owner employees. They're treated like non-owning employees. 
And by that, I mean the deduction for them is unlimited and the amount that they don't have to report an income is unlimited. Once again, as long as the overall comp is reasonable. So I see cases every week where they're deducting a single premium continuation of benefits rider. Uh, and it's a great way for C corporation owner employees who have retained earnings in the C corporation to get some of those retained earnings out without having to report it personally in income tax. So C corporation sale in this 162 bonus setting with asset care is a great sale. Now for your other owner employees, it's a little bit different for your pass through entities. So sole proprietors, S corps, LLCs, partnerships, these are known as what's called a, a pass through tax entity. The taxation of the entity flows through and is actually taxed at the employee level. In all of those situations, the owner employee is limited to what is called the age-related table for long-term care premiums. In the section 213 of the tax code, there is a table that says if you're an individual on your individual return, uh, on your individual return, your deduction as an itemized medical expense is limited at a certain level for long-term care premiums. And it's age-related. So for example, in 2020, if you're 40 or less, that limit is $430. Ages 41 to 50, it's 810. Ages 51 to 60, it's 1630. Ages 61 to 70, it's 4350. And over 70, it's 5430. So what you can see from those numbers is that it gets higher as you go up. I would say most of the policies we sell in the business setting are for people in their early 60s or they're now really thinking about long-term care and the employer knows that this is a very valuable benefit to them. And if you buy joint coverage at that 4350 level, obviously now you're talking uh, you know, over $8,000 in a deduction annually for long-term care. So it still works even though they're, they're subject to the age-related table, especially if they're doing it on a 10-pay basis. Um, and one thing I'd like to point out with this is that even for your pass-throughs, it's better than for individuals. So for example, most people say, well, is a long-term care insurance deductible? Well, the code provides that it's deductible, but the problem is that that deduction for most individual taxpayers is illusory or, or paltry. And by that, what I'm saying is to get the deduction on your individual return, first you need to itemize. And with the standard deduction being so high now, most taxpayers are not itemizing. I think the numbers from uh, 2018 were uh, only about 15% itemized. Usually it ran between 30 and 35% annually. But mm -hmm. after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where they raised that standard deduction to 24,000 per couple, there are far fewer people itemizing. So first of all, if you want to deduct medical expenses of which long-term care is a part, you have to itemize. Second of all, if you itemize, your medical expenses are subject to a 7.5% adjusted gross income floor. And what that means is your medical expenses need to exceed that amount before you can deduct anything. Now, that used to be 10%. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act lowered it back to 7.5% for two years. Starting again in 2021, it's going to go back up to 10% unless Congress at the last minute decides to change it as they are apt to do. But anyway, those are the rules for individuals. And so once you've got above even that 7.5 or 10% AGI floor, then you're still subject to that age-related table. So on an individual basis, I would say it's fair to state that the deduction is never the driver of a sale because it's, there's not enough there to, to really entice a buyer who otherwise might not be interested to buy. But in the business setting, especially once again for C corporations, that deduction can be quite large. For your pass-through owner, they still know they're going to get the age-related table amount because of the way taxation works for these owners. If I pay long-term care expense out of my S corporation for myself as an S corp owner, I'm limited to that age-related table deduction, but it comes through on my tax return on my 1040 above the line. In other words, I don't have to itemize to get the benefit of that deduction. It's one of the downward adjustments to income that you do after you get gross income. There are these downward adjustments uh, before you get to adjusted gross income. And one of those downward adjustments is what you paid for 
self-employed medical coverage to include long-term care premiums. So there are kind of three levels of benefit in long-term care deductions if you look at it. Not so good for individuals, okay for pass-through owners, and really good for C-corporation owner employees and non-owning employees. Okay. Dave, thanks for that. That was really good information. And I know we're uh, pretty much out of time, so if we have to take an answer to this offline, uh, let me know. But uh, I've heard about employers I'm sure it's a C-Corp situation, um, looking at limited pay options, let's say an asset care 10 pay, and kind of using that where they pay that for the employee for all the above mentioned reasons, but also kind of use it as a golden handcuff. So after that period of time where that policy is paid off, the employee is still there, they can convert ownership to the employee and the employee employee can put whatever, whoever they want as beneficiaries. Have you seen that before? And is that really a viable option? Well, yeah, and that's kind of an alternative, if you will, to the standard 162. So in your standard 162 plan, the employee owns the policy from the beginning and the employer is paying the premium. Now, sometimes if the employer wants to add a handcuff on that policy, you can endorse a life insurance policy that says the employee cannot access the cash in that policy without the employer's consent for a certain period of time. You know, so for like 10 years or until a retirement date. And so we do see that from time to time um, where you put a restrictive endorsement on the policy as a golden handcuff. So that's a possibility. But once again, in that setting, the employee owns from the very beginning. We do see occasionally where the employer will say, I wanna own this policy until the employee retires. I want to control the, the asset, control the cash, uh, I'm willing to have it be a benefit for them after they retire, uh, but I want to own it up front now. And they can do that. They can own it basically as key man life coverage. And what will happen is the employer should have what's called a 105 plan in that setting where the employer simply has a resolution that says, if the employee goes to long-term care while they're working, we're going to reimburse our long-term care expenses. And they'll do that obviously with the policy. Then let's say the employee gets to the retirement date and they retire. Then at that point in time, your employer normally will transfer the policy to the employee. Now, at that point in time, the cash value in that policy is going to be compensation to the employee. Once again, the employer deducts it as compensation paid. The employee reports it as compensation received. So you have to deal with that tax eventuality when you roll the policy out, if you will when you transfer it from the employer to the employee. But we do see okay. some cases like that where control is really important up front to the employer. And so what they do is they do basically a key man policy and they'll have a separate agreement sometimes, which I call a section 83 agreement, which basically says to the employee, if and only if you stay until retirement, we guarantee that we'll transfer this policy out to you at that point in time. Okay. Dave, thanks. That was some really good information and I uh, really appreciate you being on today. And just so our listeners know, you've helped Kevin and I in the past with complex questions that our accounts have had. So at the agency level or even the producer level, if they have a complex situation or case and they wanna you know, have a discussion with you about it, Kevin and I can set up a conference call and they can go over the basics with you just at the professional level. Is that, is that uh, something that you're willing to commit to? Because I know you've done it for me very successfully in the past. By all means. And once again, as I said before, I think One America with our Care Solutions product line is unique in the industry because of the way we've configured the product. Uh, it works very, very well in the business setting and in the bonus setting. And uh, you know, getting your hands around the ownership issues and the tax treatment is the key thing. And we're always more than, uh, than happy to discuss those issues with the professional advisors. Dave, thank you very much for your time and the level of expertise uh, that you bring to, to all of us and to our accounts and really appreciate you uh, sharing this information about, which I think is very valuable on this uh, 162 bonus plans with us today. So thanks again. Thank you. Well, you were right about that, Kevin. There's a lot of great information Dave had. He always has good information for us. And just a quick recap, this plan is an advantage at both levels. The ownership level, certainly it's another deduction for them. And then, of course, it's an advantage to the employee. They're getting a tremendous benefit 
and they've got another bonus on top of the bonus to take care of taxes. So it's a win-win all the way around. Um, just a uh, reminder, coming up real soon on June 23rd, 3 o'clock, Kevin and I are going to be running our first client webcast. So it's a great opportunity for you to come in and check it out yourself. Or if you have some clients who are interested now in finding out some more information, that's the whole purpose of it. This is done to really gear towards giving their clients some uh, overview on understanding of long-term care at a high level so that they get their curiosity peaked, go back to you as the advisor, the agency's running illustrations, there's all the activity going as it should be. So that's what we're looking to do. Hopefully you can uh, uh, find that email from Kevin, that email from myself, and uh, we will certainly be sending those out uh, between now and then. Um, that's about it, Kevin. I'm going to leave you with a thought from uh, someone who in the history of the United States was one of the wealthiest people we ever had on the face of our country, John D. Rockefeller, and he had something I thought was pretty simple but insightful. He said the secret to success is to do the common thing uncommonly well. So I hope you guys find something you can do uncommonly well this week. Have a great week, and we'll look forward to seeing you real soon. Thanks for joining in. Coffee breakout.